What is it, Lamar? All right. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Let's get it. Another episode of the Lamar Carlo Show. Got in the studio today. Uh, gentlemen, I meant to write you a bio. Um, we went to high school together, uh, middle school together, um, community college. <laughs> uh, welcome to the studio, Joel Zametti. Yeah, what up, what up? <sighs> I had some sound effects there. What's going on, man? Post effects will be dope. How you feel? I'm good. You? Good to have you in the studio, man. Spot Thanks for dope. coming through. Spot is dope. Thank you Loving so much. It. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming through. Thank you for coming through. So um, today's episode, I got some notes because I'm professional, like Larry King out here. Hit me. Let me see. So today's episode, I uh, so I, I I mainly know you know Joel through school, and we've had a. Uh, a big relationship through uh, music, through hip hop. This is actually the gentleman that actually got me started writing my first raps. So uh, mm, that's big. That that is actually considering where you are now. Yeah, considering where I am now. Considering where, where I am now. Let me. Um, so um, this guy in I guess it was that middle school, high school era, passed me a pencil, a pen, and a pad of paper in his basement on a on a dual cassette tech. Mm -hmm dual cassette deck boom box playing instrumentals passing the microphone back and forth i remember the song too I, I can hear it i can't give you the details but i remember it doing doing one take on it passing it back and forth that's how you learn breath control so um it, it was it was that that uh i guess got me started on my journey and uh here i am now with um I don't know what studio number this is for me, but uh, this is definitely an upgrade from uh, the last one. Got me on the podcast stroll. And uh, let me see if I can log in right here to my uh, United Masters account. Let's check this out. I've never actually done this online, but I want to. Look at me as an official artist. Hey, now. Look at this. Look, look, look at <laughs> Pandora's not paying a damn thing. Uh, I'm not even sure what Deezer is, but uh, shout out to Spotify with the dollar. Uh, shout out to Meta with the whole $10 payout there. Uh, let me see. I got $8 coming in from uh, Inspiration. That's what's up. Didn't didn't even realize that. That was a nice little there. breakdown. Yeah, it's a nice little breakdown. It only go up. Only go only up. Only go up. Only go up. Anyway, yeah, so this guy who started me writing... Thank you. <laughs> it was that. always, a, it would have came out sooner or later. An artist is an artist. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so to, I, I tried to get him in here today to uh, talk about hip hop and uh, you still do that at one point. beats and rhymes and all of that great stuff. But this guy, if you cannot tell by his outfit mm. and the, the knife that is, that is draped around his, it's that, a tool. That, that's, that's not a knife. That's a knife around his neck. He's a, um, a bit of a survivalist now. And uh, today we're gonna speak about some survivalists. Let me get my... Uh... Actually, while you do that, I let that term, that moniker, yeah. survivalist, is like taking on kind of a negative connotation over the years, especially with probably, I blame reality TV around after 2000 a little bit with all the shows. It has bag, it, it kind of brings up the thoughts of like the uh, zombie apocalypse, anti-government kook who's like prepping, you know what I mean? So I, I kind of... It, it brings in the question, what are we, what are we going to, what are we trying well, to it's, survive? It's, survivalist is like a, a suitcase term that can mean many things. But so I, I tend to tell people that are uh, wilderness uh, training or bushcraft, I won't shy away from the term survivalist, but uh, the distinction needs to be made, you know what I mean? So what is your definition that you consider to be a survivalist? Uh, well, anyone can be a, like a, a soldier in war could be a survivalist Okay. by that term. You know what I mean? Um, someone who comes out of the other side of a cancer battle could be a survivalist. Okay. And that's what I mean by that, that term. If you want to specify it, be wilderness survival. The only two things I can think of that those situations would have in common would be the mental 
aspect of survival. That's huge in wilderness survival. If you, if you were to go to any library or any bookstore and buy a survival book, generally, if not always, the first chapter is all about the psychology of survival. And if you fold mentally, you'll fold physically. I mean, you could go on about that. For, but uh, that's generally what happens to people when they get out there is they panic. It's called bush panic. And that adrenaline cocktail can serve to cut off your rational thinking and you start doing a bunch of things that you shouldn't do. And then one problem leads to a bunch of others. And So like realizing you're lost or your GPS isn't working. That's, or there's, that's it. That, that, there's, a, there's a bear over there. That would be the, the latter one you said would be the, the rare circumstance. But the, the people get lost in so many different ways. You could just be walking your dog and let it off the leash. It sees a rabbit. It goes. You chase it. And that's all it takes. It, ha- it happens so quick. You know what I mean? So so you realize you're lost. <clears throat> your heart starts to race. Your GPS, your phone has no signal. Here's what people do when they don't know what to do. Uh, panic, sets, panic sets in. They start walking fast. Because they need something familiar. That, that I got to get somewhere. That walking fast starts turning into running. There's never a time you should be running. There's only two times you should run when you're in the woods. And that if something's chasing you and, and it's imminent, or you are lost and you see SAR search and rescue and you're trying to flag him down. When you start running, a, a whole host of negative things start happening. You set yourself up for mechanical injury because you're not paying attention. That rock you thought would hold doesn't. Trip, trip. The, the tree branch that hits you in the eye, you start uh, perspiring. And that's the last thing you want to do is get wet because the number one way people die in a survival situation is hypothermia, low body temperature. You could miss signs that you would have picked up had you been calm, the tree blazing and stuff like that because you're running right by it. So the moment you realize you're lost, you need to just sit for a second take a breath think about the last time you definitively knew exactly where you were and where that is but the the thing that kills people the most is that they're afraid to spend the night that's what it comes down to i gotta get out of here fast they don't abide by the two hour rule which is if you don't know where you are or can't get back to where you're going within two hours of that sun coming down you need to make a base camp and they don't and they, and they keep going and then they get tired and they're wet and they think that posting up under a tree or a rock is going to help. But then conduction sets in and it rips body heat from you because that cold object is colder than your body temperature. And you would have been just better just carrying on through the night and, and doing, you know, muscle activities that would have kept you warm, warmer. S- setting up a base camp. Yeah. The, the, the two hour rule. So for anyone who doesn't, if you were to take your hand like this here and put it to the bottom of the sun, each finger represents 15 minutes. So one hand is one hour and you would walk that down to the horizon. And that's how you know how much daylight you have left. 15 minutes per finger. Or one hour per hand width. Yeah. And just walk it right down. So if you have two hours left and you're out there and you don't know what you're doing, you need to get yourself you need some shelter a fire if you can if you can do that but shelter stay dry so that's you know, assuming that it's going to take you about two hours to well this, the situations are like uh the situations in which you get in a survival situation are going to dictate your actions there's people that are on a, a canoe and it dunks the canoe goes down river and now you're on on the side right. uh regular hiking trips mountain bikers that take a crash and they're 100 of miles out and they can't you know they got to walk that bike back right. so and then of course the weather dictates and then and then your bioregion which one you're in your your priorities will be different in the desert than they will be in the arctic so on and so forth and stuff like that oh man all right assuming nobody's in the arctic i have uh gone hiking in the desert or at least the mountains mountain hiking on the west coast is way different than forest way hiking different. here it's on the east arid, coast arid regions are are tough <laughs> Very I'm tough. talking about hot, just yeah, hot. And, that, and now we're going to the other side, which is hyperthermia, which sets in when you're when you're out over there. But yeah, then your priority becomes shade and water, as opposed to if you were on the East Coast and it was storming, shelter and, and staying dry. You know, you're looking in the desert, you're looking for water, and in other circumstances, you're looking out for water so that it doesn't harm you. Interesting. Yeah. All right, so we're on the East Coast. We're hiking through the woods. We're in 
Great Falls. We're somewhere back here in Leesburg, somewhere. We think it's safe. We're hiking. We've got kids. We've got the dogs. <laughs> how how much can you trust a dog? If can in what circumstance? Uh, you're out in the woods and you did you realize in this moment, oh my God, my phone's not working. I don't even know where we are. I can't recognize anything around here. Right. We need to get back somewhere. Dogs, lead me back home. No. <laughs> are they gonna No, you gotta have a really strong relationship with your dog and some serious pre training before that. But <laughs> they're 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 not worried about the seeking shelter. Survival situations or the when, when I was, we were kind of pre-discussing this earlier and I was telling you there were different types of survival like E&E survival which is escape and evasion and homesteading and aboriginal and primitive, primitive skills and mine's primarily a 72 hour survival particularly in eastern woodlands deciduous forest because that's where I train you know I know the flora and fauna a little bit if you take me out of my bioregion it's going to be stranger than hell there's a lot of generalities that can cross over to that but um 72 hours because you figure in 72 hours well no, actually rescued or there's a reason why it's called that it's, it, it, assuming you left a game plan before you left which which is to say i'm i'm leaving friday and i'm coming back sunday okay. to loved ones and if they don't hear from you on that sunday generally you are found 72 hours or less interesting so the goal is wow to be able to survive that three-day period <laughs> death window yeah that's a, a the it's like over 80 percent or something like that it, and once that you go past that it dramatically drops wow so that's why it's 72 hour have you ever gone out intending to like uh stay longer than and camped out longer than no 70 no mm -hmm. that's that's the threshold if so there's things you can do as a family man and there's things that you can you know i mean yeah, if that, i that didn't have a wife a and a daughter there's yeah. a, i'd be a lot more adventurous yeah you know definitely. what i'm saying definitely i have to take that into consideration but uh, wow all right um damn there, there's a whole host of tangents i'd like to go down there but i've learned from my experience of editing these shows later that uh, i need to stay on task let me um now we can spider web the question let, me, let, let me see here um what what inspired you like what what what, what did it start because actually it's a, it's a logical progression right if you like to go in the woods and you like to go alone in the woods and yeah i like to go on trails sometimes you like to go off trail if you go alone off trail in the woods it would behoove you to know a thing or two about a thing or two mm -hmm. uh, so that that's how it starts once okay. you get into the subject matter I found it profoundly interesting. Uh, essentially, you're learning about nature anyway. And then there's all types of uh, snowball effect of positivity, self-reliance uh, that you learn and, and stuff like that. Gives you a, a greater confidence in other realms outside of nature, just learning about this stuff. So, What were the, what were the, like the first things that once you were out there, you, was it like trying to make a fire? Was it trying to eat berries? What? Fire, probably, yeah. Uh, I said, well, actually, you'll know this because uh, we grew up together. So you know where I grew up at, in Rokeby. Right. And at that time, and we were at the end of that cul-de-sac before development started, that was all forestry. Me and, and Kenny and Chris and Lee and the two Kevins and Vince and even Adam, we grew up in that woods. Like when we saved money, we would bury it in the woods. The woods was our <laughs> bank. That's what's up you grow up with a comfortability of being in the woods. A lot yeah. of people are nature adjacent, mm -hmm. but they don't, they're not, they don't recreate in the woods. Nature so meaning they live in and next around. to it, but don't get it, you know, or they do the regular glamping trips, park the car camp right, and, and leave. But so prior to all the construction and, 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 and the, the, the imminent domain. I and mean, there was, it was just your a, other than a few just, dilapidated farmhouses. Yeah. It was just endless forestry that we would, playing you know what i mean and, and that that was the initial nature introduction like picking up frogs and you know all that stuff but yeah so when you start learning bushcraft though there's priorities food water shelter fire and fire is uh the most humbling so that's the one we started with and then where did that lead everywhere else kind of but yeah fire is just uh primary uh we uh, there was a specific time period actually <clears throat> Well, Bill, his dad was uh, away on business for three years, and he was kind of house sitting. And uh, you know that area back there is kind of free, and there's a lot of resources. We, we did fires all the time, only in the harshest conditions. We did 
post rain fires, rain fires, snow fires, wind fires. Never use a lighter or match. Just training. So this was more yeah. or less like a game and challenging, or were you actually thinking? Well, you, the first time you do something can't be when you're in a survival situation. So you were actually thinking one day this might actually be beneficial. Well, yeah, you just got you got to train. You you have to train so that it's second nature. When so you weren't just out a there. pyro out in the woods playing with matches. You were. Well, I was controlled. You know, everything is controlled out there. There's a, there's different fire like firemen know fire way differently. The wilderness fire is a lot different than chemical fire and all that right, right. jazz. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like that's what I'm concentrated on. Which, which woods are best? You know, stuff like that. Tinder and natural materials, all that jazz. Okay, so you're out in the woods picking up frogs now you're making fires after rainstorms you're feeling like man like like uh something happens i can uh, I, I can live out here um what else what's there is what, a piece there is a peace of mind yeah that comes with that i mean definitely. that's not the goal you know no, uh, you know self self-reliance and one with nature and all that yeah yeah what was what was what was the next essential thing that you could well it's an endless I mean, you're never going to master the, the, it's mother nature. It's constantly evolving. So you know what, what I mean, uh, food, clothing and shelter, what, what order and what, in, in what precedence does the, the circumstance three? always dictates the order in which, and, the the bioregion you're going into the one thing I will say is though, the, as far as kit though, uh, they call it the five C's or the five most important things that you should go out with, which is a cutting edge combustion device, cordage cover and container those are the five c's and i have three of them on me right now i'm sorry All right, say, say it one more time that's cutting edge okay combustion device cordage container and cover wow what's the difference between a container well i guess does a container needs a cover well no, i'll show you what I'm, i'll tell you what i mean by that demonstrate the, please so on this, this is the cordage ah okay. this would be the cordage this is 11 1100 pound test uh paracord okay uh, a so little different from 550 which is here this is the cutting edge obviously and the combustion device is the ferro rod i have on the back so three out of the five are just around my neck got you the container is easy water you just a container for water right and then the cover is any type it starts with your clothing and it could be a poncho it could be a mylar blanket it could be a tent it could be a hammock a sleeping bag whatever but those are the five c's so what looks like just a necklace well, i mean i guess it kind of looks like you've got a blade but it's not only a so it's the, the rope of the necklace is a paracord mm. which has the tensillary strength of three million thousand pounds here this is a little bit different one but this one's for you oh oh hey before listen. you pop that that's a very sharp knife okay don't play around with that knife uh, you know what i mean it may be tight but just try it yeah, there it is. There it is. Okay. All right, bet. There's All a right. there's a trigger to pop it, and I'll tell you the mechanics of it a little bit later. Oh, but that's man. a Mora knife. It's Swedish steel. First of all, let me just say thank you to I've had I've had a few guests on the show, and uh, you are the first guest that is that have brought me a gift. Oh, we bring so gifts. Uh, I appreciate that. I'm gonna have you be the first one to sign my door, and uh, you're you're gonna leave here with some paraphernalia some type little, of merch as well bag. that's right <laughs> some <laughs> little, little little thank you gift box yeah. get you some uh mugs and hoodies no i appreciate that all right yeah, so man. what we got here so <clears throat> if you were to hold it with your fingers like this here see how i'm not holding the sheath at all and then there's a little pop with the thumb so look at it see this action oh yeah oh, okay all right, it looks like a, like a Faberware. Um, it won't cut like it. All right, so uh, this is a uh, palm length. I don't know if that's still a thing. <laughs> I don't think they allow you to walk around with fixed blades anyway. Oh, uh, that's okay. a fixed. Well, we gotcha. can discuss the difference of that too. Non foldable but, blade. Yeah. Okay. All right, and does this one also have the? Uh, can I make it? It does not. No, oh, no, okay. no, no, no. I right. give you the stronger one. Actually, having that ferro rod kind of, uh, <clears throat> like I say it ruins the structural integrity of the blade but it weakens just a little bit i should have brought the uh blade that you gave me that does actually i still have um the one large black knife that you gave me that has the uh i guess the knife itself is has a ferro rod made yeah. of carbon steel 
Is that what it is? Yeah. So carbon steel um, is it when when you what scratch it's it a, with a flint? What is it's it? It's a ferro rod, which is short for ferrocerium. Fer okay, and that's um, a type of metal or a coating. Like a it's a actually this is a common uh, it's a chemical actually I think it's on the chart uh, periodic table okay I think. but uh this won't hurt your table or anything. But that's essentially the action. That's that's what's going happen in there. Interesting. So. And this blade is made out of carbon steel. Carbon steel. These are all carbon steel knives. So that wouldn't do that if you had just a screwdriver. Or There's some debate over that. So stainless steel knives. There's stainless steel knives and carbon steel knives. They say stainless steel knives. I've heard don't. But then they. I've read that anything harder than the ferro rod surface will do the trick. But also the carbon steel. Why it's beneficial too is if uh, I was in a riverbed and there was quartz. In there, I could strike a spark off of that. With my knife, do a flint steel fire. I thought quartz was, if I remember science class, that was the brittle one that you could like. It is brittle. It is brittle. When, when I'm striking it, it'll break apart. But I thought you said it had to be harder than the ferro rod. Well, that's the the knife's coming. Uh, some of the sparks come off the knife, not off the rod. That's interesting. You know what I mean? It's just a weird look. And then uh, I'm looking for anything in nature that resembles a cotton ball. It's the easiest way I can describe that. There's a bunch of things like that. Moss. The inside of a cattail, a uh, bird's nest, squirrel nest. Because they, they actually collect all the, the best stuff anyway. So you can just, they do it for you. Kind of amazing the way they do it. Squirrels, um, when you're walking through the woods, sometimes at the base of a tree, you'll see like a, a gnarled pile of acorns where they've been sitting in there. And that's your first clue that if you were to look up, you could see their nests. And what you do is you cut down a reach pole, obviously, because you're not going to climb that tree. And you just knock it down and you catch it. And when you look inside that, it, it's like uh, they've gathered up a collection of all the softest material you can in light the forest. All of that <laughs> it's, it's animal fur, it's cattail, it, it's just. Uh, it's perfect. Anything I mean, you would make your spot cozy with. It's a was. one one strike fire. They they have it so dry in there. So yeah, they got it unlocked. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, yeah, I watch a lot of documentaries, and I saw that uh, an eagle's nest can weigh up to like three tons. Is what it said. Like I, that doesn't even Lord. make sense to me. May, may, I must I, I I must be misquoting that wrong because the well, the amount of it, things I start that they about maybe mud put that in their nest is but man-made materials things that they find from you know litter and you know that here's somebody's shoe like let's throw that in there if it works for them amazing how much do you uh like uh is your knowledge of sur you call survivalism survival ship bushcraft bushcraft is your is does it come more um uh, knowledge-based, text-based, or is it more like do you observe nature itself? And yeah, I guess everything just started is theoretical, in that you're you're reading about this. I know some of it comes when you're out there and you learn certain things, but you you like about the the, the squirrel and the, the 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 pile at the bottom of the tree. Is that something that you can walk in that you noticed? When you're in the woods, oh, what is that? Oh, that must have come from there. Or did you like no, read it somewhere? It, correct. And then you saw it, is it now. next time. Yeah. Yep. The more you read, the more from it. You'll, you'll, the more information you obtain, you'll start walking through with different eyes. That's deep. And you'll see different things. That's deep. You know what I mean? But there's, uh, there's, there's always an excellent. I, I was out one time and heard this noise that I had never heard before like this high shrill like something like a banshee would make i know exactly what you're talking about i i, I just could i couldn't pinpoint it and i was trying to walk closer to the noise uh and i <laughs> you wait wait a minute pause well no i knew it wasn't a uh something what, alive what time of day oh no, i knew it wasn't something alive okay yeah, yeah, yeah. okay it's just what the hell makes noises dead well i'm about to tell you it's okay this, all right the, it's so weird when you're out there because you you think you got it all figured out and you know what things are but um I realized that the noise was coinciding with like a, a wind breeze and, and what was happening is that there were two trees and though they were not together down here they were married up top and the friction between the it had rubbed off the bark and it was like down to the cambium layer and the friction between the two trees was causing this high squealing noise and i started to realize like man i wonder how many people back in the day thought that that was like some witch and killed a bunch of folk for it or like thought Man. it was some banshee and like you know what i mean just like just weird weird things when you're out there so every time you're out there you just 
learn new noises, that's, see new things, smell new smells. That's deep. How long did it take you to, once you heard it and started investigating, till you realized that's what it was? Like 10 minutes. Because it was above me, and I was, I was like, I know I'm here, I hear it. And then I started to look up, and you can see it, and you can feel the the breeze and, and the rhythm of it. It was just a awkward, awkward noise. You remember back in the day, though, when we were hanging out, and like a fox <laughs> would do its bark. It would do a vulpine curse, which Man. is like anything related to a fox. And folks would just run because they thought it was a woman screaming. That's what I thought that you were talking about. Me and my wife, we yeah. were outside by a fire. Or if you've ever heard skunks in mating season. I wouldn't. Oh, yeah, my. That maybe. sounds like... That sounds like two women getting killed. It, it's maybe pretty horrifying. It we were out. We were out in the fire pit one night. It was years ago, and it, you know everything is quiet. You're hearing like crickets, and all of a sudden, it sounded like some little girl was being brutalized. Was it constant or was it rhythmic? Was it like man? It was first. It was like in the distance, this shrieking scream, and we looked at each other like that's creepy. The next time we heard it, it was like wait that sounds like it's closer and then by the third time we heard it it sounded like it was like right behind us like sound like fox it man yeah. it was it was like this mixed with like a witch laughing and like a little girl getting murdered yeah fox kind of like, had that canine giggle too so yeah ran in the house immediately yeah <laughs> did you yeah. swear to god both of us <laughs> ran in the house immediately i think she might have been behind me i was the first one in. it was like what the f is that but uh, yeah, I think we looked it up later. And it but was those like, are actually the small misconceptions that like keep people out of the woods. It, it would, you know what? Things like that. It would keep me away. A fox you know cry. I mean? It's funny what things make noises that sound like other things. I was watching the show and they were like, um, uh, the, the, the inner nasal of an ox bone is what people use for like duck calls or something. It's like mm. who, what, when did, or like the shoulder blade of a calf is what they were using to dig like... I. You know, uh, nature's crazy. It's like everything is there for you, but well, when they back in the day, you know, our ancestors don't waste used anything. every part of that animal. They ate every the bones were tools, the entrails were bait, uh, the fur obviously for their clothing and their shelter, every, intestines, you know, for bags, and they they respected that you know the spirit of that animal. They thanked that animal for what it was giving them. You know, that's essentially what all of bushcraft is. All these survivalists out there, all just trying to recreate what the Horani did in the jungle or the Bedouins did in the desert or the Native Americans did where we are or the the Arctic the Inuits in the Arctic or the Zulu in Africa all the original people that did this like that's what we're all learning from that's the tree that's the lineage you, know you think I mean? animals are smarter than humans at surviving, surviving yeah 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 they've been here a lot longer yeah yeah Yep, for sure. I mean, you know, the squirrel's out there with nothing. And you put a human out there for three days and they might die. The squirrel's just going to be looking at him. He's been out there all winter. <laughs> is that uh, our reliance or what, what is it about? I mean, humans, we're, we're we pretty much done. We are far they're, away from our primitive they're, they're, roots. But even you know, in our primitive roots, there's no other animal being on this planet that when it's born, it needs to be nursed for 18 years before it's released out into the like. I've seen... I've seen a giraffe get born and walk in four minutes or uh, uh, those iguanas that get born in the sand. And when they come out, their first thing to do is look around like where are the snakes at? Like where is that genetic have, code? Uh, is that have you seen that new movie Out of Darkness that just came out on Amazon Prime? It follows a tribe of early humans about 45,000 years ago. But the reason why I kind of like the realism of that tribe the tribe like has an elder like they call him he was i think his name was wisdom i am wisdom or something like that he's he's probably 30 you know what i mean and the the people that were like like if you were 12 and 15 you were grown so i you know back then they were actually doing it earlier you said nurture till you're 18 they were actually out on their own killing hunting and leading tribes at like 15 yeah, they also had a young lifespan. No, shortly, super so, young lifespan. You know, fifteen yeah. to them was probably like fifty to us. The, <laughs> the change, just just the uh, the evolution of everything, how it changes and stuff like that. But so, what is it that you think is there? Um, I don't know. Is there what? What is it that animals are born with when they know instinctively things about nature that? And that's we where don't. you'd have to get into like a 
evolutionary biologist and I assume that each species is going to have its own right definitely. crazy nut stories it's just um, the fact that they've been here for millions of years longer gives them that advantage that, that's it yeah, it's just I saw that my dog I they 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 always run in circles and I've I like chasing their tail I never knew but uh, I just recently a saw a, or something, a, like that. something like that. I thought that's what it was but I just recently saw a TikTok that said that dogs feel the earth's magnetic field like birds and bees and they, they spin around to find which direction is north because that's the direction that they poop in hmm. I don't know the validity of that but it I mean like there, is, what yeah. what how do you you think we'll ever be able to feel our mag the, the magnetic field instead of like what no <laughs> Uh, actually, we, we, I think we've topped out as, as humans. But no, man, we've still got 90% of our brain. Like we, there's something that we can unlock where we're going we're gonna to be able to fly. And That's actually a fair argument to say. But uh, Richard, Dawkins, Richard Dawkins actually makes this point quite well because a lot of people think that we may advance to be like have bigger brains and, and stuff like that. But oh, Just use for, the ones we got. Well, technology is what's going to advance. In, in order for us to advance as a it would have to be that only the smartest of us reproduce. Now, is it the case that only the smartest of us reproduce? Well, the Nazis tried that. You know I mean, well, they, 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 they tried everything. If, I, I was, I've been on my. You dumb ah sterile. I've been on my World War II stuff. Oh so man, I stay were, on it. Modern marvels. Oh my gosh. Man, listen. Oh, the scientists. Man, listen. All of them over in Argentina now, probably chilling. They're, they, oh, they're still yeah yeah they're ex, yeah they're expatriated. They we went and got them. <laughs> Germans? Oh yeah, oh, brought him back over and said, "Oh yeah. my God, what were y'all doing over there? We need some of that. Ramp it up." <laughs> but uh, I was just talking about that with with Sheeta, how Hitler and his, his I forgot one of his right hand goons, how he was sending him all over the world to take everyone's most precious artifacts to try to harness their powers everywhere, Egypt, whatever. Just take all your stuff, all your artwork, all your gold. On some know. like Indiana Jones shit, like uh, the some, evil version, because it ain't going in a museum. Yeah, you know what I mean. But like, like to find like mysticism or just for like blunder, plundering. No, he said he he wanted its inherent powers. He believed that they had, you know, Ark of Covenant type stuff. Yep. I believe it, man. I mean, when you when you have the whole world its resources at your fingertips, it's like I. What wouldn't you try to find? I had this, this might kind of correlate and it makes me think of it. Maybe I shouldn't even put this out there because I haven't patented it yet. But I think Neil Tyson, some it might have been Carl saying somebody had a quote where they said, um, technology more advanced than yours will be uh, indistinguishable from magic. So, something along those lines. I, I think it was Neil Tyson, yeah, because he's he said if I was to pull this out, and he talked about his iPhone, if I was to pull this out 20 years ago, I would be burned at the stake for witchcraft. Exactly. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Exactly. And it's like technology and magic. It's it's. I think magic has a a, a like you said, like kind of like survivalist has a bad uh, connotation nowadays. People oh, okay. hear magic, but I, I guess here maybe in the Western world, I don't know. But it's like oh, magic, oh, hocus pocus, you know, voodoo, blah blah blah. But I think there's um, I don't know if you want to, I don't know, call it the unexplained or I, technology that you can't understand. Like I, I look at like splitting atoms and shit like that, or or like electricity, electromagnetic magnetic spectrum visible light like all that is like i guess where my comprehension of kind of things kind Dark of matter. dwindles yeah. then i think that's kind of where i either insert you know either faith or magic or i don't know uh just lack of understanding which i'm perfectly fine with yeah. but like uh, well there's times where we have to acquiesce to higher authorities of people who do study these matters for a living assuming that it's solvable i forgot who it was that said maybe it was noam chomsky you said uh uh, puzzles are solvable mysteries are not um, interesting but some things because of in my opinion and a lot of other people's opinion how we came up evolutionarily speaking in the in the plains of Africa just trying to not get eaten by lions we are not going to be able to ever understand the macro or the micro the very large or the very small it's just not going to be intuitive to us the, the physics of the universe and such like, it may never be you think this is our first like um civil civilization like uh as far as technology goes and uh the ability to harness electricity or do you think uh former technology is a yeah that that's a vaguer word because you could say 
irrigation systems that they created back then were a type of technology, but you, you just set it to electricity. Yeah. So I don't know. That's tough. Harnessing energy um, through the electromagnetic spectrum. I mean, rocks that have different polarity have been mm -hmm. around before humans. Like um, you're being able to hit two rocks together and make them spark or put two rocks together and they attract or repel each other. Like that's right. all some could say magic at some point in time in history or you know now we say we understand what's happening there and like forces repel and in certain and, circumstances uh, yeah they may yeah. attract and so anyway to, to get back to so i had this 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 vision as i was looking out at the forestry and stuff and thinking about ancient civilizations like and and, and then uh uh I think it's what Elon Musk's uh, or is it Zuckerberg's? One of them got like the Neuralink that they're working on. You uh, seen that? I'm familiar with the concept. So I guess it's pretty much like your, you know, phone or your uh, watch or whatever, but like an implant basically, and um, you know, download kung fu. And I, I don't think on that's actually type. how it works, but I think they're getting announced where like we people, people might be able to communicate uh, using it, uh, like thought or right, right, right. I think now the implications are like I can change my television channel by thinking it as if picking up the remote and saying it wasn't convenient enough now I can look over there and I can think light turn off and I don't have to say hey Siri and the Neuralink will do it I would definitely be concerned about some sort of interference <sighs> especially if it became popular and everyone I was like how then it could be hacked too couldn't it and people could it it it, it leads open to a whole a, a series of yeah. questions but I, i'm thinking sometime in the future once all that is worked out everybody's got their Neuralink, and you know for the for the for the next month for the five thousand dollars for christmas they're putting out the new upgrade where your Neuralink has a you've, you've got like the your universal translator which they've kind of have now I, I can speak to you in another language yeah. and it'll speak to me and i can speak to it and it'll speak to you but now it's coming out with the animal upgrade so now you can when you hear the birds chirp it'll go outside and you're just gonna be like hey mate hey mate hey mate looking for a mate or hmm. you know i mean i feel like i feel like that's not too far away well i feel like uh, what is it who, who's a expert at birds ornithology is that is that what they are i feel like an ornithology expert could uh, and then, and detail the, all the birds. Exactly. And then the and next then, month after that, it's like the oh, the dolphin package is coming out because I saw a documentary. Each dolphin has its own. Well, that's echolocation now. Now we're dealing well, with the, whatever noise they make. Each yeah. dolphin has its distinct uh, noise, which you know is their name. Mm. So when you hear another do dolphin saying, making this noise, they're calling this other dolphin. So like. Animals do communicate. Some like um, oh, for sure. Uh, penguins, like there millions of penguins, and they're all. Yeah. But this one little penguin can hear the distinct his mother from all of those. So there, there's something there acoustically yeah. that you know defines different animals. So I'm thinking one of these days, our you know Neuralink, Universal Thought, our our Siri app, Google Translate is going to expand to the animal kingdom be interesting <laughs> i'm trying to think of what it, would, what would, it would would you want like. to know what the animals are saying yeah a little bit for sure i think that'd be dope i'm, I'm imagining like um if i'm trying to wrap my head around the accuracy of it but i'm imagining tribes in africa like you know having like cheetahs around them and like uh you know another tribe they're, 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 they're fine they're, already they're the rhinoceros tribe they're and, fine already yeah. in my opinion other than the you know the, in the survival aspect of it what I'm talking about yeah. they're already uh, at one with nature out there I remember uh, I was watching a guy who was in uh, South Africa uh, Cody Lundin survival he was doing a thing and he's he, there were like he saw his first lion not at the zoo like he's walking around and he's oh my god there's a lion he's like man I just, he's like I want to be Zulu so fast I just want to learn how to be you know what I mean just like live they know all the nuances yeah what to do what not to do I mean they're like the everything in in Africa. It seems like it has like vine, like they can puncture a tire. I forgot what the little thorns and vines. Everything has, and they just walk around it barefoot. Like it's no problem. I mean, they're just. 
yeah, would you be interested in doing like a survivalist show where they drop you off and would, would, there, would there have to be like cash depending on the circumstances or, yeah for sure depending on the circumstances yeah that'd be dope I saw this one documentary about this deep jungle in Africa that okay that's that tough explorers have not been able to penetrate and yeah. at night there's noises and hums and unexplained this and that and mm -hmm. Like, are you, so you're more of like a like Appalachian Trail kind of like how 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 remote do you, would you feel comfortable? Appalachian Trail is my wheel wheelhouse. Desert, I mean, sorry, uh, jungle is is rough. It's like the number one rule of the jungle is off stay off the ground or be comfortable with things crawling on you all the time. You just have to, <laughs> <clears throat> so like remember I was saying uh, each environment has its its pros and cons, right? So w when you're in the jungle, there's Typically, water everywhere. Right, centipedes this big. Well, that you don't have to. Well, they do sting and they could uh, cause anaphylactic shock. But they're like, there's water everywhere. There's water and bamboo. There's jungle vines. Right. Like so, th so that's not an issue. Okay. The issue is th the wildlife, the scorpions, the Situational snakes. Situational awareness. Uh, yeah, and it's just everywhere. Like the cacophony of insects, it's, it's deafening. So you um, feel more like prey in the jungle than... Well, you are on the menu because they have panther and they have big cats, as opposed to the Appalachian Trail, where you're not on the menu. I mean, bears don't want a piece of you. Generally, they only attack if they're with their cubs or you surprise them. But if you're in the jungle, eh, and there's panther, puma, or uh, leopard, you're on the menu. Cats are an interesting species. Wild jungle cats. Yeah. Yeah. Panthers especially. They they Panthers from what I've read they don't from what I've seen. They don't um they they're not pack animals. They're, I think they're the only cat that I don't I think they're solitary. I yeah. think most of the yeah, other than lions and cheetahs yeah, and stuff, but the jungle tigers. cats I think they are solitary cats. Yeah. That's crazy, man. Yeah. That's, so when when you say bushman, I, the first thing I think of is like um African um like um <sighs> you know what? Uh, uh, I mean, that'll work. Wearing stick carrying. They call it New Zealand too. They call it the bush, uh, and even in Australia, it's called the bush. But yeah, I've I've seen a video of like uh, the bushmen. Uh, they they uh, looking for water. Uh, put salt in a rock. Kalahari bushmen. And, yeah. and let wait for the the monkey would grab the salt. And yeah. They capture the monkey and wait till it gets thirsty and release the let, monkey. They capture him and then give him as much salt and. They, <laughs> uh, is that, while that was a dope story, Dave Chappelle actually spun that into an awesome analogy for anyone who hasn't seen that. Look that up. It's on uh, Oprah. What, what was it? What, what was the gist of the... He was talking about... Um, let go of the salt. <laughs> he was like, I was smart enough to let go. Yeah. I think I remember that analogy now. Yeah. yeah. What do you think is the... Uh, what, what have you found to be the most amazing um, organism, animal, whatever in nature that just fungus like what i mean it's an animal the, the, <laughs> the water bear they call it the tardigrade okay yeah lives in everything Can't Li kill it. yeah extreme conditions fire in at the bottom of the ocean in a volcano all in that space because i think that freeze it that lends credence to the uh panspermia theory that that um life can be birthed from other planets you know started on mars an asteroid hit mars microbes flew from mars through the atmosphere into Earth. yeah so essentially a violent impact hit and cause like for anyone needs a visual neil tyson does this good imagine you sprinkle a bunch of cheerios on a bed and then you come jump on the bed and they all fly up so the impact actually causes the surrounding debris to reach escape velocity and inside the nooks and crannies of the debris are things like tardigrades or whatever bacterial stowaways that could eventually reach earth's orbit make their way down to us thus seeding life possibly it's a it's a cogent extrapolation of events that could explain you think life started uh you think life started one way or multiple ways one way like an initial yeah like life, yeah an initial life one, one way itself. i don't know yeah they're still putting because it because in order for panspermia to be a thing something had to start to mm -hmm. what started something to could be able the, to panspermia like if you look at a uh, member prometheus that movie yeah, the i love it. he he hate he the think, ending but. yeah i know he came down there and they they seeded life you know he uh, broke himself open and then what was his, his DNA and his, his enzymes and all that were being just separated and reconstructed and all that like so that's one theory the ancient alien type deal the other is the primordial sludge theory essentially uh, struck with lightning type thing which could happen anywhere yeah okay so evolutionary speed like uh, a lot of people you know 
they're trying to figure out how uh, single cell organisms became twin celled organisms. Everything else has worked out. It's the beginning yeah. that they don't know, hence the theory title. And that's that's what we're referring to, how life started. We have Which no way idea. do you think is most plausible? Hmm. Some are funner than others. <laughs> Try not to be biased about it. True. This is true. I kind of like the young earth primordial sludge type deal, but mm -hmm. Speaking I, of Young Earth, yeah. Well, finish your answer before. No, that's I'm, I'm yeah, It just host. coincides with a with a, a lot of things that would make sense. But I guess okay. it would be funner if we were descendants from Martians. Sludge is cool, but they they've tried to they've tried to make that sludge. They have no. <laughs> they it's a what was it called? It was the hydron collider yeah, yeah, yeah. or something like that. Yeah, They're trying to find the God particle. Is right. what they call it. Yeah. yeah. They just made a bunch of black holes. Essentially. Essentially, yeah, yeah. I think so. I mean, you, from what we know. We're trying, you know, we, what did we invent cars 150 years ago? And now we're trying to figure out the origins of life. Like, it's going to take some time. It'll take a little bit of time here. Not too much longer. Um, as fascinated as I was with those vision pros, my daughter's like, in eh, 10 years, it'll be in my contacts. Like, that's already there. That's already a thing. <laughs> um, yeah, but man. That's already a thing. thing. Just like how, like, the government was using cell phones and, like, was it World War One or something like that, you know? Yeah, I know. Certain things are already think. Oh, I forgot what the guy said. Once you see a technology, just know it's already been out for probably three decades before that, or, or such. Bring it back home. Where would you? Um, you're 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 forced into the woods. You're forced out of your house, and uh, you have to take your wife and kids. What what do you think those? Would, what are your most uh, plausible scenarios of having to put your survivability in action? And he's a, that's a tough scenario anytime you're forced to leave home base so like and not a cheeky response but if i'm forced to leave my home then i'm going right in my backyard what but if i'm forced the, to leave the area is what you're saying what are the top three reasons that you think that that would occur mm. it would have to be government intervention from inside or outside but so like i actually the, don't uh, see that as a i see like the so like war, a bomb is dropped, they need your land, your... No, evacuation area, yeah, okay. that could be one, which would suck too because uh, they call it the fear flight response or something like that. If anyone's seen the movie War of the Worlds with Tom Cruise, when everyone tries to can't leave... You can't go far. You can't go anywhere. You <laughs> can't go anywhere. You can't go I can't anywhere. Even, I can't even go to work at 8 o'clock in the morning. Unless you have a boat or an off-road like motorcycle or something, you're not going anywhere. So you're, you're tramping, you're walking, you're, you know what I mean? So you can only carry so much you know what i mean okay um disaster um from some type of man-made or non-man-made well that's actually our like uh katrina was was absolutely a, a natural disaster that brought about survival scenarios i watched les stroud everyone knows him survivor man he went down there and did interviews with those people the that was crucial conditions. I mean, the second story of your house, all the water surrounding you was full of pathogens and dead bodies and sewer. That, that, you know what I mean? So a lot of people Just a forget that, death that type of thing. That was a serious like, survival situation there where people uh, you needed uh, rescue from third party. Um, that so days. that can't happen. Yeah. Other ones, not so, you know, like, um, well, this is regionally. So we're re regionally based here in uh, Northern Virginia, where we are at the Digital Content Lab Studio. Probably not going to get hit with a flood. Right. We're not uh, below sea level, so uh, no tornado, no earthquake. Been to California five times in the last five months, and every time I go, they, that damn song, man. Every time I go there, it's rains, <laughs> it's earthquake. Every time I go there, there's a moment where I'm somewhere, and everybody pulls out all of their phones at once. Where I'm in a market somewhere, and you're just me, 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 and everybody, oh, like, uh, get, you're in a death area, earthquake imminent, uh, 4.2 on the way, mudslides on the way, seek high ground. Like yeah. every time I go out there, it's like this is not it's unnerving. Sunshine <laughs> and palm trees, man. This is it's the fault line, though. Yeah, right? I man. Mean, it's like these thirty million dollar homes, but they're built on this cliff that at any moment is. <laughs> I, I tell Sheeta that all the time. I look at these, I'm like. Man, no, we, I could yo, not I, live. I rode through Malibu. Man, these houses were. I've never seen any like it was just awe inspiring. And I'm on Zillow the whole time, riding through the neighborhood, like forty million, 
30 mm. million. And I'm just looking at the structures. It's on like, that's going to hold. That's that's going to be there for a while. <laughs> Man, yeah, I couldn't amazing. be in, I couldn't be in a house that it was like that. even like take it away from the decadent and go down to like Georgia and stuff like that. There's people that build their homes there on stilts because it floods so much. Even that would unnerve me. You know what I mean? You think this is the uh I don't know, safest place in America as far as uh uh, if you think if there's you, actually a couple answers if to that you question. think the worst thing to fear as far as having to put your survivability in action would be natural or man-made disaster do you think we, that you're in a, the best area to avoid such because we, we don't deal with any of you know those it's kind of a yes and no actually there's a group that i'm in we are close to washington dc so it's yeah, ground that's zero. that's the, the negative downswing the they were looking at uh the top 10 uh, top 15 states i think for survivability mm-hmm. and they were talking about nature resources stuff like that and virginia was in that top 15 lucky now, the, the, lucky the colonizers landed here right huh. but that that was the nature <laughs> aspect of it you the and they the still almost next didn't to make DC, it uh ground, with the ground zero yeah blast radius yeah possibly they said if a new kit you you wouldn't even like it, 30 seconds or something like that and well i would just hope that there is on that day a very strong gale force westerly wind taking that elsewhere yeah. but i mean it, that's a, as morbid as it sounds that's a situation i'm okay with a situation where i can do absolutely nothing interesting the yeah. situation that would hurt me is where i could have done something Man. They call it like the rule of threes. It's it's loosely based, but like it was at uh, three minutes without air, three hours in wet, windy, cold conditions, uh, three days without water, three weeks without food. That's like the rule of threes there. Yeah, yeah. So, but people fixate on food too much in a survival situation. It's a lot less important than water. Water is way more important than food. Than way more important than food. Yeah. Yep. Do fish drink water? Do they need to? I don't know they need to. I just, I don't know. Just wondering. I guess I wouldn't be surprised either way. Because, I mean, most, I, what about fish that live in salt water? How do they, do they need fresh water? Well, they're saltwater fish, so I assume not. Yeah. Like, how does that, how does that work? But yeah, we should uh, talk about water, actually. Uh, More fascinated by uh, undiscovered ocean or undiscovered space? Space. Yeah, yeah, because space has both oceans too. That's deep. Like Neil said, he wants to go to the Europa, That's deep. which has a liquid ocean under the ice, and he wants to cut a hole. Is it water, methane? Something it's water. There? Yeah, and like he said, well, he they're putting a, uh, tying a lot of assumptions together, but everywhere we found water, we found life. So let's go check out this water. Liquid water. Liquid water. Yeah. yeah. It's a frozen surface with liquid water underneath. Because they found uh, they found frozen water on the poles of Mars, right? Um, I think they, so. I think it's on the pole, on there, the dark side of the moon too, or poles of the moon. But was was there tardigrades there? No. No. The the by the way, when we were talking about panspermia, the reason why they say that is because there there are like uh, dried up and meandering riverbeds on the surface of Mars. So they know that there was once water, and if there's life everywhere, there's water. That's the assumption they're making. What happened to it? That, that's that's what makes the uh, panspermia more plausible, I guess. Well, going back to my question about um, do you think that there could have been advanced technologies previous to ours that utilized electricity? Um, you know, was could, could could if panspermia was a thing, then that mean that there maybe was human-like. Here's my thing. All the all the alien movies, they've got two arms, two legs most of the time. They're anthropomorphic. And, yeah, they, yeah. You know, is that because someone has to get in a suit and be it and act Except it? for the arrival. Actually, that's 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 the Neil's arrival, big uh, the blob. Yeah, that's uh, Neil's big thing. Is the that fog? It, most life on Earth doesn't have a face, so why would we think that? You know, but and man, I've seen some some. Have you ever seen like the faces of parasites? Oh my god! Or, yeah. <laughs> or like these yeah. things that are microscopic but look terrifying yeah, yeah. that's too uh could people you, could you imagine if people, even if they were friendly and they arrived and they look like that <laughs> people in the in the woods are always talking about bears and stuff that's scary and what they need to be worried about is ticks parasites like there, there's things that don't want a piece of you and there's things that do want a piece of you mosquitoes and ticks want a piece of you ticks are i, I cannot stand ticks oh, man, that's the, the main thing i look out for when i'm out in the woods is ticks man. 
more uh, than anything else. Lyme disease. Yep. And so a little advice for anyone at home is don't wear dark colored clothing. Oh, yeah. Because you cannot see the contrast of the tick. <laughs> I used to always go in the woods you know. with nothing but camo on. <laughs> it's like, well, yeah, yeah, no, that's not good. A little yeah. bit. But like, yeah, if you're, that's why if you look in the stores, most pants are, are khaki, golden khaki, slate gray, anthracite, or olive drab. They're not black because you can't see the contrasting spider or tick and easily flick it off. You're saying that uh, the number one thing is mental fortitude? Yeah. This guy came past my house one time. He was like, um, you know, when it all happens and the bombs drop, meet me in the sewer. And I was like, what? What are you talking about? And he was like, yeah, I got my bags packed. I'm going to be in the sewer. He, he like pointed, he pointed like, you know, down to the storm drain. And I just, it, I just visualized like, like a community being under the streets in the sewer system. One, how safe is that? Mm -hmm. Two, is that any safer than being on ground? Are, are you safe from radiation? Like, is it was was there any? Have you heard any survivalist stuff about flee to the sewers? No, but I guess that would help him withstand an initial blast. I don't see that blocking out any radiation whatsoever. Furthermore, depending on how bad the bombs are and covers the sky, all your resources are going to be outside. Uh, I'm not quite sure how you would filter and clean that sewer water. Zero. So, so you're saying that is nothing. That is not what you would do as a bushman is to flee to the, there's there's no shelter. There's no resource. There's Only no, if I was trying to withstand an initial blast. But no, the you're going to need outside resources. You're going to need nature. Uh, you can't carry it all with you. You know what I mean? And plus, you'd have to crawl, I think, a lot. And, and there's sewer systems that are absolutely huge. I was actually just reading a book about one uh happened in the 70s where a bunch of kids went exploring in sewer systems they got lost it was massive uh, the size of a city grid uh and the, yeah underground and there were there were homeless people living under there that was kind of the crux of the book there were like you know pockets of, of people that were living under there but none of the all of them were coming topside to get things to bring back down you know what i mean yeah so like amphibian like it was just you can live down there but you got to come back up yeah air and water i actually just uh speaking of the world war ii one there was um, a story of it was late 1945 and the allies were bombing the hell out of them and the germans kind of knew it was up and they had you know uh munitions piles and and stocks of stuff and rather than let those turn over into enemy hands they would just blow them up before they leave whatever their stockpiles were, munitions, supplies, and stuff like that. Upon one such occasion, there were six soldiers uh, inside of, of a, a stockpile that they assumed were uh, looting at the time. It blew them up. <clears throat> Not blew them up, but blew them up and trapped them in there. Six of them in there. Uh, six year duration that they were in there. Uh, two of them died early of, of disease. Two of them committed suicide. Uh, now we're at the four year mark the, since it was uh, they had rations down there they had candles food and water and stuff zero light though after four years they ran out of all that supplies and they were living off rainwater that was coming through the cracks or whatever but after six years they finally dug them up or uncovered a thing the first guy walked out and instantly had a heart attack from the light and the shock leaving only the one guy that survived Until so like when you're down there you're going to get acclimated sewers you're going to get acclimated to all types of weirdness it'll change your whole chemistry probably your vision for darkness will probably get better i'm trying not to go down the uh that's deep uh the the, the like the the joe rogan uh tunnel here but i feel like you know this survivability chat just tends to lead way to um i don't know um extremes and, and and hypotheses and what we're surviving from and almost like conspiracy theorists sort of almost um, subject matter so I'm trying to stay off of that and keep right. it authentic but at the same time it's like all right so like Hugh Glass what they made the revenant after how how like did so Middle Earth like you think uh, what, what is the you think, you think there's a civilization that I mean people adapt you know what I'm saying? Uh, uh, somebody find a cave somewhere and they just kept migrating down and 
there's there's more fresh water under the earth than there is on top of the earth and it's true they don't have sunlight or i don't know what type of ventilation caves have like i walk around luray caverns and those stalagmites are 400 million years old like they are and they do have no sunlight but i wonder how fascinating what, but there's light by there's a bioluminescence and they would need stuff down there. something down there to eat there's there's chemical reactions there's um i just saw something where somebody created light by uh, uh mixing two chemicals together and it was sustainable but yeah that's how they used to do heat lamps or lamps back in the day for people that were spelunking they would take a little chemical rock and you would spit on it inside the pyramids inside. completely dark yeah. but detail unimaginable oh well that's uh, now you're talking <laughs> ultimate mysteries forget the inside they're still trying to figure out how they did the outside <laughs> exactly. you know but your point about adaptation evolutionary evolutionarily speaking is is if, if so we were stay to take out the sewers <laughs> well, yeah probably if, if you were to take a cave and that cave had a species of let's say spider in it but the cave was open and it had light and stuff and then some natural effect happened where it closed off the cave those spiders over the course of years would evolve different traits they would yeah. probably lose their sight you know and just go off of you know stuff so adaptation is just in the natural world is off the hook not so much for us you seen um have you seen the island dr moreau the island of dr moreau yeah Dude. i'm familiar it's been a long time since long, i seen that movie time. that's uh, a val kilmer movie. maybe that's val kilmer wow yeah. obviously certain genetic strands can't commingle and and make an organism but i mean they you know they, as much they, as the germans they, tried they're, they're taking the labradoodle or the, the, the you know that some things or like um a man a man and a tiger obviously aren't going to be able to but um, I've seen some weird things where they take a caterpillar and a and a spider and make a spider pillar mm -hmm. or a shark shark DNA and a worm mm -hmm. and made a, a swarm. Like I've seen some weird things and I, and I, I, I start like I don't know how real it is or if it's you know. I've definitely seen some reanimation stuff videos of that where they took like uh, that the, the severed head of a dead dog and hooked it back up to life. That was a real thing. I mean, you know. That's deep. In order to, suffice it to say, in order to break new ground in science, there's there's periods of immorality that happen there. It, that's just what it's going to be. Who was it? There was somebody, somebody who was it? Uh, Galileo, Aristotle, one of them was like, uh, you know, if there's... Uh, so many plants in the solar, uh, uh, so many planets in the solar system, and so many solar systems. Blah, blah, blah. Like, where is everybody? Whoever was mm -hmm. the one that said that. So, and then I also the very next thing that followed up that I was watching a documentary about how, like, when we're looking out in the space, we're actually really looking into the past because light takes time to travel through space because of the speed of light. And so, it it occurs to me while I'm sitting there <laughs> and I'm watching. This shit expanded my mind and I'm like well that's why like it seems really clear to me why we can't find anybody <laughs> because all the pictures that were taken are of the past if there was somebody in Andromeda right now on whatever earth like planet or whatever planet would sustain their form of life in whatever galaxy Proxima B and they were shining their form of the James Webb telescope at earth taking a picture right now like oh that's in the Goldilocks zone that has the potential for life let's take a picture of that by the time it took for the light from our solar system to get to Proxima B, Proxima B, then it would actually be a picture of Earth when it was like a ball of lava and unhospitable. And so it's like people could be looking at Earth right now like, oh, where's the life? But the picture that they would be seeing of Earth isn't going to be us in a podcast studio. Mm. It's going to be this this forming celestial body from eight billion years ago. Yeah, that's well, he's another way of saying that is so we're never going to be able to see aliens because what he was saying is as more time passes and they're getting the further harder away it's going to be yeah, at a more faster time, rate mm -hmm, day yeah, by day which which we didn't know i think james webb of uh, the original 
not the new James Webb, James Webb was the original one to figure so out. So eventually the, the speed of the expansion of the universe is going to be eventually larger than the speed of light that travels through the universe. So we ain't going to be able to see nothing anyway. We're not even technologically close anyway. Here, he put it to you. Like, they they were trying to ask him directly, uh, to Neil Tyson again. They said the closest planet, Proxima B, Goldilocks planet. How far away is that? I think he said uh, 40 light years or so. And they said, what, what, translate that. What does that mean to us? Uh, okay, with the best technology and the fastest ships that we have right now, it would take about 40 to 60,000 years to get there, which means that we would have to put people on there who would have to reproduce, and then they would have to grow up and reproduce, grow up, reproduce, grow up. And then even, no time soon anyway. They wouldn't even be Earthlings by the time like that happened. No, by the they would have been born in space. They would have been. They would not even be thinking about this home. That we, we would be to them like Jesus is to us. <laughs> like. Like, there would be stories about Bethlehem and Earth, and yeah. <laughs> that's that's so it's not feasible, not plausible, which is unfortunate. So, which, so we're gonna have to hope for the other way around that they're gonna find us and they're gonna visit us because we're never gonna be able to find them. Our well, at least not where while, not, while we're here. Not while we're here, yeah. So there is life. We just they haven't found us yet. I think Maybe the quote, they have. I just, think the quote is uh, given the vastness of the universe. Um, and how much Goldilocks planets are stars up? It's all, it's almost irresponsible to think that there's not life on. Now, when I say that, people understand that I mean that could be bacterial. It doesn't mean anthropomorphic intelligent life. It's just some sort of of life, some sort of organism. Now, it could be more advanced, less advanced. Nothing we ever thought of. But is that humbling? Does that scare you? Does that no? The, 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 the possibility of another life form finding us and i can see why that would be unnerving that like doesn't I, I i watch a lot of nature so I, I imagine that there either is or will be or are can be a species that is watching us just like we watch ants like ants don't know that they're in an ant colony they just dig speaking of ants <laughs> this actually might make some people feel better so there could be a species out there that's so far advanced when i mean ant ours. colony i mean like that that pain glass yeah thing. i know what you yeah. mean yeah yeah uh, but there could be a species out there so advanced than ours um, that we are like ants or a worm to them. And and the point is, when you walk down the street, when's the last time you stopped and talked to a worm or cared? This is true. So you just may not care. They could have just passed us by plenty of times. We could just be nothings to them, you know. But I'm I'm very fascinated by the ants. Lift ten times its own weight. Can communicate telepathically work as a hive sure, me too i just i just imagine like as much as i admire and watch and study nature like the animals the plants the insects um, the way that they parent the way that they raise up their young it's all really fascinating me so i would i would not be surprised if there was some species either here or outside of here like observing watching us just like we watch National Geographic like oh they nurture their young for 18 years oh and and they um, like to watch porn for recreation these are some interesting animals here that you know they they, they, they kill each other for fun not 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 too many species on the planet actually do that you have uh, or even further if you look into Nick Bostrom who's an Oxonian professor for Oxford look into his simulation theory uh he argues that we are all in fact most likely part of a simulation and actually not real at all and there's actually just a few simple steps uh it takes to get you there but I, yeah i think i saw the argument that uh probability wise mm. that, that it, it's more probable that we are in a simulation than we are correct yeah yeah because <laughs> We can make simulations, mm -hmm. and we can make simulations that make simulations. All, all you would have to do is just grant that people of the future would make simulations like we do now, and therefore uh, simulated universes would outnumber real ones, therefore most likely putting us in the simulated universe. Exactly. You know, which is a weird way to think about that. That Now, that I wouldn't like. Remember you asked me earlier how life started? That would suck a little bit, but it's whatever. If you found out that you were just a digitized a program or digitized, well, I mean, I mean, what what it what is your definition of digital? Well, I guess that would change it, wouldn't it? If that was a real thing, 
Yeah. Is that like, is that ones and zeros? Is binary, that binary, straight binary? Vibrations? Is that. I guess the equation would be for people to easily understand would be a matrix, the matrix thing that we'd be like in the matrix, essentially. Um, I was thinking about this. Explaining you, color to a man that was born blind. Man, all that jazz. I was thinking about that today. Like, well, I was thinking about it. My wife was watching something about like, how do you, how do you explain faith to somebody? And it was like, imagine being born blind and there's something that you're aware of that you don't have, but somebody else has. So you have to trust them and take their hand and, and blah, 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 blah. Like you know, mm. all of that. But, and I, and from that, I was trying to like, how do you, someone's born blind. How, how do I explain? Okay, so what I do is I see. What do you mean you see? Uh, I use my eyes. Those These things right here. Well, they could get that part. Going further is going to be like, way what, difficult. Like, yeah, like what? I mean, I'm not even thinking about how do you, what's green and like, but what, like, what, how do you explain sight? I think I can get away with splay, a sight early, uh, better than colors. And well, is that the same as trying to explain faith? <laughs> well, see, I, I assuming a, a blind person is seeing only darkness. Uh, so then if you just, I'm, I'm assuming they can wrap their head. We're talking about people who were born blind, obviously, or else this, this is not going to work for people, people who People that are blind. born blind though, still, cause when I close my eyes, I still see images right now. I still see colors. That would depend on their method of their blindness. I guess I know some people have cancer of the eyes and, the, and they were removed and I don't, you know, I don't know what's going on in there. What well, the retinas. people who saw and can comprehend and know what sight That's is what I said. People who were born blind. That have no yeah. idea what like. I don't think you could ever could accurately describe color. Ever. But they're just going to have to. You know what I mean? So, so could Jesus actually define and tell someone, explain to them what faith is? Quit. If you were born faithless. Well, <laughs> he had the healing touch. Any, anyway, uh, couldn't he? Give give sight. That's cheating. <laughs> well, uh, I guess I guess it's canonically inelegant, um, but he had that uh, omniscience it's easy or omniscience. Explain sight to someone who's never seen. If you can put some mud in their eye and spit on it, <laughs> give uh, hearing to the deaf. Oh know? man, man. All right. Well, this is this conversation has led to uh, an incredible, what I think will be a, a powerful series of of what ifs and what to do wins you you might have just right there you might have just titled it what you ifs? have segments like segments. what ifs and what to do wins what ifs, what and ifs the mysteries of something you know what I, mean? I love it i love it we'll work on it um plenty more to talk about plenty more to dive into thank you to my esteemed guest and I, w- I would say self-proclaimed, but uh, 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 aficionado and uh, woodsman, bushman, extraordinaire, it survivalist. It um, if it goes down. Uh, Don't come to my house. <laughs> People keep saying that. I'm going to come find you. <laughs> Leave me and mine alone. Ah, uh, That's hilarious. <laughs> That's funny. Um, I, I met a guy who had uh, he was showing me his um, his gun room and right. uh, his 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 fallout shelter that he has on his property. And I mean, he's showing me his uh, t- t- double reinforced steel rub- rub- rhubarb concrete walls and walls of ammunition and every gun from every movie that i've ever seen see i'm glad you brought that up because actually people should know that uh, so you're to uh, he's preparing for a uh, urban survival maybe the same right? thing you are like the government getting a, you up a little people uh, place too much importance on guns in that circumstance guns are important in that circumstance but if you were to do a top 10 list it'd be like six or seven you know what i mean so the fact that he's showing you all his guns he didn't show you uh like a water filtration system, a he water did. catch. Okay. He actually had one of those that, that, he, that he pees in and it turns into water. Well, that's not going to be enough. But yeah, I mean, that's cool. But I guess you got to have, have enough water to drink first to pee. Well, I was hoping he <laughs> would just catch rainwater, you know, yeah. cool stuff like that. That Like, you can't drink your bullets. Your guns don't keep you warm. You can't eat your mags. He definitely had a... Uh, he, he's not planning to go anywhere. That's... You know, you, that's your, your the, that's ideal for every everybody. Your survivability was seventy two days when you have to leave. Yeah, his well, that's like, wilderness. His was I'm hunkered in, down. In urban survival, you should never want to go anywhere because then you're restricted to only what you can carry. You, you should always be next to your home base unless you're forced out. 
so I don't blame her for that. But yeah, a lot of times people buy too much munitions. They don't place the emphasis on like food, water. Man, bullets are heavy. Like first of all, when I go to the range and I've got that's what I'm saying. Like if you're forced to leave with me, like that's he. So you, you saw you saw that. all his stuff, right? If he was forced to leave, would oh, he be man. able to bring all that? I'm sure he has a bag that he has a bug out bag. Packed, yeah. But no, there, there's, there's a, no way a bob, and everyone should have one of those too. Uh, a no bug way. out bag in their in their okay. car. I mean, no, his his place was definitely like you know if something happens, we're we're gonna we're gonna hunker down right here and we're gonna we're gonna wait it out. By the way, that's also uh, people that have stuff like that should not tell other people that they have stuff like that. Uh, people's minds frames drastically change in uh, well, scenarios like that, and he will get come, you know. What or, led me there to think about him was when you said, "Don't come to my house." A lot of people said because that was one of the things I said to him. I said, "All right, man, if it ever goes down, I'm gonna yeah, come to your house." Yeah. So, uh, does he have a family? First of all, he didn't even sh- show me where he lives. So this oh, is, I was gonna uh, say if he had a family and he oh, invited yeah, he, y'all he over, then he family. just cut his family's food supply. He's got a wife and four kids too. I mean, no, no one. He's not letting us in. He's his kids are shooting us. Oh, there you go. Damn. He's definitely not letting us. In. I don't know. He's a nice guy though. Maybe he would let us in if he recognized me. Then again, who knows, man? The end of days. That'll that'll uh, change your whole mind frame. The only reason I even have guns now is, I mean, I've lived my whole life, forty some odd years. I've never, I've never even shot a gun until the pandemic hit. Right, you and started training. All a of bit. a sudden, all of a sudden, there's no meat on the shelves, and I don't even eat meat. But right. I'm like, huh, what's going on? There's no toilet paper. I don't even know what the f- that means. But that's you know ridiculous. That Let people... me go get some guns because. Yeah. I don't, and apparently I wasn't the only one that thought like that because there was no guns available. Yeah. Everything was like quadruple the price. That's a good analogy for people. So if people in this county want to think about how this could go, just imagine if for COVID was one or we get this serious snowstorm and you go into the store and it's barren. Those are non-emergency circumstances. You are barely even slightly inconvenient. So you can imagine if something serious did happen you would be able to obtain nothing. You better already have it. FEMA suggests that you should have three weeks worth of supplies for every man, man woman, and child in your in your house. That gives, I say three months. That gives me I, anxiety. I don't do three weeks, I do three months. Right there, That's that gives me anxiety. Like I see people that are stocked up and like have storage of all type of stuff. And one part of me is like, man, I, I wish that I had put in like that type of time and effort towards that. But another part of me is like, mm. Well, see, this is why the more you know, the less you need. But then it's like every, what everybody says every time I carry my gun everywhere. It's like, well, I'd rather have it not need it than need it not have it. <laughs> I don't, you know, I don't mind if responsible gun owners carry their their gun around or whatever, you know. So like guns that. are good, but uh, six on the list, not the, it would be, back back. It's uh, it'll crack bullets. the top ten, but it's definitely not in the, can't not eat not in the bullets top five. And you can't really carry them with you. As you. In, in certain in certain circumstances, depending on the weather or where you're forced out, you will either. Uh, you could freeze the, de- you know, like this, this is the thing that I can't stand when people say um, like they're instantly just going to become murderers. Like, yeah, I didn't have enough food, but I got guns. I'll just go take someone else's stuff. You're going to commit every week murders to feed your family uh, like those people are dug into and, and you're on the offensive. You're not in a defensive position. So you have to get gun battles every time you want to eat. Does that sound feasible? How, how long is that going to last? You know what I mean? Like. So all of a sudden you're just capable to do that. Then. The guns are for protecting what you, what you've uh, you went, accrued. You went from clocking in to now now you about to now now you now you now you the ops. Yeah, I don't. For the most part, that's not a. I don't know. But no, everyone should just learn a little bit. I, what I do is for the the photographers, the the, the hunters, the hikers, the, anyone who wants to go out and, and recreate and feel more comfortable doing so. Should they get lost or get in a situation like that so you know practical I mean? versus it uh, is my goal would be to get more people out in nature people may who are reluctant the more people who are in nature will fall in love with it the more they love nature the more that will save it so maybe it's a, a preservation chain that can be started here you know the uh when we me and my wife went to go see neil tyson last his uh speech was uh, I forgot what the title was, but it was basically like everything on earth is trying to kill you. Did everything. he give the statistics on how uh, the odds of you just being here? Usually he leads off with that. Uh, he gives the sperm count on how hard it is for you to actually, the, the odds, the trillions. Yeah, that, that, that's a good place to start. The fact that you're even here and now that you're the, here. like the, And then, yeah, we're hurtling on this, this rock that's going, you know. <laughs> 
50 to 100,000 miles, however it passes, you know what I mean? And yeah, and there's things flying all around, especially back in the day. But yeah, he's he's accurate. Like the nations. four things that get yeah. you sick in, in water are like parasites, protozoas, bacteria, and viruses. Viruses are extremely rare in North American waterways, but in other places. That's it. Those are the four things that, that, that get you sick, and they're all microscopic. They're measured in microns. So for people who talk about water clarity, water clarity should have nothing to do uh, is that, with is that, what you drink. Do you have those things in what's considered fresh water? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are waterborne pathogens. Those are the things like uh, uh, Cryptosporidium and Gerardia. They call it beaver fever. Basically, they're like, you know, poop and excrement and, and dead stuff. From animals. From, from animals, yeah, and stuff like that. That's why when you're above the tree line and, and water's coming down, you can drink it off off the ground. Coming fine. From the Any water that's on the ground is suspect. Everyone should know that. I know people's, certain people can grow up building up pathogens to wild water that they drink. But yeah, uh, I hate it when my dogs drink from like puddles. Well, they have different stomachs though. Their, their stomach's way stronger than ours. Interesting. So they, they can actually do that. But wow. there's like, you could, I could have water in this in, in here that's the clarity of chocolate milk and it's cleaner than crystal clear water. <laughs> that's deep. Because the, the things that get you sick, again, are microscopic. That's you know? deep. Huh. So you have to boil or pasteurize them out. Yeah. That, like the ability, the number one tool, if, it, if stuff was to go down or whatever, the ability to locate and process clean water is like paramount. Like, you know what I mean? I don't care how many guns you have. Like if you don't have that knowledge and you and your family short, you're gonna need it for everything, for cooking, for hydration. Obviously it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a cellular necessity. That's, a, that's another thing too let's rule out that misconception about people eating snow too snow is uh 90 air 10 percent water okay so people you know people the process that it takes for your body to digest that will actually put you in a hyperthermic state <laughs> Wait. ice is 90 percent water 10 percent snow that's what you need to collect and, and process down that if you're above the tree line which is, if you're above the tree line that's all fresh water drink right off no birds nothing's tainted that water above the tree line. yeah as soon as the trees start that means life starts all water is suspect from that point on so it's a weird thing dirty water below tree line pond suspect mucky definitely don't drink it well don't it, drink it without processing it it evaporates forms a cloud rains on top of a mountain then you can drink that sure can yeah. so the process of the natural process of evaporization but you could do that yourself though and that's how you so if I was on an island, that's exactly how I would clean salt water. I would take a metal tin and I would take a copper piece of tubing that goes through there and I would put the ocean water in there and the fire underneath and it would uh, condense that in, or it would go into steam and then it would condense into water on the other side. You know, exothermic reaction. Yeah, because a lot of people still think for some reason that you can boil seawater and you'll be fine it's not the case it's not a desalinator it doesn't do that but you can drink the accumulated steam yeah you can create the steam that condenses into water that's deep it's a it's a building a desalinator so. that's deep this is the the more you know the less you need right so if you know that you know, how did the ocean get salinated i don't know did it come from the whale minerals sperm is it all whale sperm <laughs> oh. Figure with mineral deposits, you know what I'm saying, coming up from the know. bedrock have of seen, Earth. Have you ever seen where the fresh water and the salt water? Like, I have seen that. And it, like, mm -hmm. well, the, actually, that was explained. I can't. I didn't retain it yeah, to the I, point I, where I could uh, repeat yeah, it proficiently. That, but yeah, they do explain why that is natural magic to me. And yeah. like, there's there's certain fish that can go in between, and then there's like a barrier that. that well, isn't there certain things like oil and water? Certain things that just don't mix. They just yeah, can't mix because of the properties, yeah. and that could just be that. Yeah. Yeah. Wild. Wild. Well, thank you all for joining us today. This conversation would probably never end, but we'll have to eventually. So, uh, more wild. Part two. More. There's, there's going to be a. This actually is probably going to be a, a part one and a two. I'm not sure what the maximum length of. It may, it may get shorter with your edit. Yeah. So. Um, man. So, first of all, I'm. I'm let, let me end this. Uh, thank y'all for joining in. Digital Content Labs. Lamar Nickens, Joel Zametti. Until next time. Appreciate you, brother. And that's Lamar.